For years, the area known as the American Midwest was dominated by giants. These larger-than-life monstrosities towered over the landscape, leaving their peers to cower in the shadows. But in recent times, these creatures have been steadily disappearing to the point where now but an endangered few remain to remind us of a time when their kind ruled supreme. But why are they disappearing? And where do 40-foot tall fiberglass men go when they die? It's really part of that story of the rise of the, of the car culture, of the highway culture. The car culture didn't really emerge until the 50s, and these kind of things started emerging at the same time. From large dinosaurs to spoon-wielding chefs, fiberglass giants sprung up all over the American highway system in the 50s and 60s, especially in the Midwest. You know, there weren't convenience stores. And there weren't, you know, this, the, the gas stations that had everything in the world in them. Everything was separate, and so you'd come to a place and the Happy Chef or, you know, the Sinclair Dinosaur or whatever was something that you would draw your attention and particularly drew the attention of the kids who were in the back seat bored to death, and so they wanted to go there. Numerous fiberglass companies produce thousands of these creatures for small restaurants and gas stations and for large corporate entities such as the Big Boy, Sinclair, and Happy Chef chains. They absolutely tell us something about the rise and sort of codification of corporate America. Big companies um, with enormous power, so much power that they can advertise themselves with these gigantic fiberglass sculptures all over the landscape just like the Medici Chapel. Although perhaps not as immediately captivating as fiberglass, the Medici Chapel is a classic example of an early type of commissioned art, along with pre-Renaissance religious art, which both glorified the church and lured outsiders. But as time passed, money and social power changed hands, and commissioned art of this magnitude became a relic of an era gone by. And that's exactly what's happened to these fiberglass sculptures. They've outlived their usefulness. For some, they advertise pop culture products or um, restaurants and places that no longer exist. Some stations that, you know, as they got older, uh, Sinclair decided to close if they weren't making a good profit. Some of those icons were sold. Part of what's happened and part of why these things have disappeared is that you're not loading the family in a car and driving all the way across the country anymore. If they, you know, they no longer serve their original intended purpose, they're probably going to be discarded. Although some were dismantled and others buried underground, not all happy chefs suffered such a grisly fate. One instance of a rescued chef in the early 80s was the happy chef in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Pat McElliott, a native of nearby Ryan, Iowa, was the owner and manager at the time. They were going to get rid of the big happy chef out front as their logo. They weren't going to have them anymore. And I know that Father Buehler somehow got wind of that and was interested in it. He was St. Patrick's Catholic Church pastor for I think over 11 years. More so than just taking care of his parish community, um, he was involved in the ballpark which was a focal point of the community. There's ball games down there constantly all summer. He had this thing about he wanted something down to that park and I think it was kind of something to remember him by. But he was always after like, uh, you go to parks and they have a tank or an airplane. But it was his goal before he left that he wanted something down there erected or placed or something to leave as kind of his legacy, I think. Being a man of the cloth, Father Bielner understood the transubstantive nature of the grimacing chef and the value in preserving it. Pat McKellett says it's got to go today. He said, if you want it, it's laying on its side, back behind the restaurant, it's down. He said, it's got to go. And Father got, I imagine there was over 20 of us and the semi from the co-op with a flatbed and a bunch of straw and hay bales, and we headed for Cedar Rapids. Nobody knew a thing about it. You know, everybody, <laughs> all the way down, it's like, what are we getting here? 
and he exuded so much energy that it was kind of contagious. We got it up on there without an incident and we tied it down and it made it real soft with all the hay and straw bales and bounced it all the way to Ryan. Um, and, and it was fun. It really turned out to be. And then we had to set it off by hand down at Jerry Linus's shop. Well, he called, well, one night after we'd gone to bed and wanted to know if I knew anything about working fiberglass. And I said, well, yeah, I'd done a few Corvettes and stuff like that. He said, well, would you be interested in a little project for the church? <laughs> I said, well, I suppose, you know, you don't turn a Catholic priest down. Jerry Lance was a real good friend of mine. We've been friends for years and years, and the city wanted to do this, and they weren't quite sure how to go about it, so he, he knew I'd had a lot of fiberglass experience, and he called me, and I got involved in it. When Father Buehner agreed to bring it to Ryan, I don't know if he had any specific plans, and my brother had asked that it be made into an umpire in honor of Dad because of so many years yeah, that he had umpired. Sure. James McElliott was a baseball legend in Iowa. Inducted into the State Umpires Hall of Fame, McElliott had called games in the area for over 50 years. Ryan has always been a baseball community. Uh, it, it's very appropriate that, you know, a symbol of baseball would be at that park, too. A small team of mechanics, art students, and other community members was assembled to take on the project at hand. I don't think anybody realized when they went into it the, the amount of work that was going to go into it before it got done. Uh, we basically had him laying on the ground and we, we built up his tummy a little more, looked like a vest. The mouth area, we turned that into a frown, basically took the smile and turned it upside down so it looked more growly looking. and we cut the handle off the spoon and took the top and reconstructed the thumb so his thumb was going up in the air and built a baseball cap out of fiberglass. But anyway, it got to be a time deal that it had to be done by. And I know I took off a couple of days of work and, and worked a lot of nights till midnight, two o'clock, laying fiberglass on the dumb thing. The deadline was the annual Ryan celebration which would be Father Bielner's final event with the Ryan community. As he moved on to a new assignment in the church, the chef would move into an entirely new realm of meaning. With the advent of, um, of modernism and commercial culture, the growth of capitalist culture in general, you've got some real problems in terms of making any fine distinctions between art and advertising. Art is not just a painting on a wall, okay? Back in 1917, Marcel Duchamp put, the, put a urinal in an art show, called it Fountain, and introduced the idea of the art is about ideas and that anything can be art if, the, if there's an intellectual justification for it. So let's take a Happy Chef made in 1960. That big scale, brightly colored use of plastics tells me a lot about being an American and American identity and American history and culture in the 1960s. It tells us a lot about who we, who we were, what we valued as an American public. The original intent wasn't art. The original intent was commerce. The original intent was to get somebody to stop at my store. But when you take that object and you remove it from its original intent and you put it in an aesthetic sense, then it becomes art. The empire was completed in time and placed in the outfield by another joint community effort. It was at this point that the Happy Chef's transformation was officially complete. It went from something totally meaningless to our community as far as anything, you know, all it was was a gimmick for to sell food to part of a whole community, I guess. The whole community put it together to get it, and we got it, and nobody else has one. And the kids go down and play on it, and brought a lot of enjoyment to a lot of people over the years. There's been a lot of, a lot of beer drinks sat down there, look at that thing. <laughs> Well, it's kind of, it, it actually is two people's legacy. It's, it's Mr. McElliott, who his son wanted it dedicated to, but 
I always think about Father Bielner, um because he's the one that really got it. If it wasn't for him, it wouldn't be there. But now it's part of the community. There's always people that are, you know, when you do stuff like this, you're bound to have a few people that, you know, what do you think, you're, you know, you're nuts and, you know, people said it wouldn't last and it's been here for a long time. It's unique to us. I guess, I guess that's, you can't, it doesn't get any better than that. Although their mighty kingdom has fallen and their kind face extinction, it does not mean that the time of reverence for these creatures has passed. There seems to be almost this sort of pop culture resurgence of the, of the gigantic fiberglass sculpture. And then they're disappearing. And so they, the more they disappear, the more of value the ones that are left become, which is the nature of scarcity in a collecting environment. It's a retro thing. It's a nostalgia thing. I think that, that even in this 21st century, a lot of people harbor this, gee, wasn't it great back in the 1950s kind of um, attitude. And people, you know, they always have to come back for that reason. And they bring their children to see that chicken. Why wouldn't you like that chicken? You know, everyone. The grandmas and the grandpa like that chicken. Everyone loves that chicken. Advertising can have that kind of effect if it's done well. And you know, you say Happy Chef, and people, they don't remember what they served at the restaurant. I couldn't tell you what they had at the restaurant, but I certainly remember the big fiberglass kid that you could come up and push the button and he talked to you. So that is iconic, and that tells you that what they did worked, you know? Because they're gone and people still remember it. Good God. Well, in many ways, the big boy never left, sir. He's always offered the same high-quality meals at competitive prices. Shut up. Oh, 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 oh,